You may recall seeing the video that I made of the segmented ball that was made up of mahogany and aspen. Take a good look at this design. You're going to see it again. Depending on what article you read or report that you may hear, the queen has approximately 1,000 clocks. This means that she likely doesn't have to turn her head to see what time it is. Well, my mom in Kelowna, who is far more important than the queen, at least to us, has only two clocks in her living room. And while she's watching TV, she has to turn her head to the left to see what time it is. And I was thinking it would be really nice if all she had to do was just raise her eyes, like the queen. I have a nice little supply of clock movements and parts that I got from Craft Time Clockery in Ontario, so I thought I'd use one of those. I still had some nice mahogany and aspen that I had used on that bowl earlier, and I thought I'd use that on the clock so everything would match. The colors of the wood would be exactly the same. It worked out that if I wanted 24 segments to go around the outside of the dial, each segment would take up 15 degrees of the circle. And uh, that meant I had to set the table saw to 7.5 degrees because each segment had two ends. 7.5 and 7.5 and and is 15. You may have seen the earlier video I made about the small wood piece catcher that I made for my table saw. Well, now you're going to get to see it in action here. It worked really good, just the way I hoped it would. After cutting the 12 pieces of mahogany, I cut the 12 pieces of aspen. Gluing up the small pieces is always a messy job. And this clamp that you see here, I made that up, oh, must be going on 30 years ago. I used it on projects like this several times. Naturally, after the glue dried, there was a lot of hard squeeze out around the outside of the ring, and this had to be removed. I'd, I had hoped that I could use my lathe for that, but I didn't want to have to go to all the work of making a special jig. Uh, just to hold the uh, uh, ring here away from the chuck. Uh, so what I did was I just drew a, a circle around the outside to find out where the circumference was and my intent was then to just sand that away as carefully as I could. I used a parting tool here to make a recess in the ring so that the dial could sit just back slightly from the face of the ring. I thought it'd look a little nicer. With the scraper I was able to round off the inside of the ring there where the dial was going to go in. It uh, give it a less sharp look. And I also used the scraper to uh, take off some of the glue and uh, turn down the face of the ring. Get it ready for sanding. Okay, here's where I had to be really careful. That's 80 grit sandpaper on the disc. I know I should have changed it to 120, but I didn't. Anyway, when I was sanding from the mahogany into the aspen, because the aspen was so much softer, I had to be extremely careful or it would just all of a sudden go way past the line. Now, I was lucky. I kind of uh, anticipated that and uh, it worked out just fine. I didn't have to redraw my line and do it all over again. When 
Then I was using the scraper back at the lathe to remove the glue that had hardened along the face of the ring from the squeeze out. I um, left little grooves so I couldn't help it along the face there and I wanted to sand it smooth because I knew it would show up once it was varnished. So uh, one thing that's kind of interesting, I've, I found uh, just by accident that if I held uh, the ring just right, very lightly, against the uh, sanding belt there, uh, the ring would turn all by itself and you could control the speed and uh, it didn't leave any gouges or anything like that. It worked out really good. I, I was actually quite surprised. In fact, first time I turned it around and looked at it, I was scared to look. I wanted the outside of the ring to have a nice rounded edge to it, so I used this 3 8 inch quarter round bit. Well, as you can see, this came out pretty nice. It's not going to take too much sanding here to get rid of those tool marks and make it look perfectly round. One of the handiest things that I made myself here in the workshop was this downdraft sanding table. It's not very big, but it's just great for little pieces like this. And it, there's just absolutely no dust in the air whatsoever. Okay, I know that nobody's going to see the inside of the ring anyway, but I wanted to get rid of those uh, little glue squeeze-outs that were in there. Uh, I could have used a chisel, but this was a lot more fun. One of the things that I don't like about mahogany, probably the only thing I don't like about it, is that when it's sanded, the sawdust is very fine, almost like talcum powder. And here it's uh, worked its way into the large pores of the aspen. And I'm using compressed air here to try and clean that out. It worked to a certain extent, but there was still some uh, residue left in the aspen that I couldn't get out. There's got to be a way around this. I'll have to look into that. Okay, here we go with the first coat of varathane. And I know that the ice cream pail will likely leave a little mark where the where it touches the back of the ring but nobody sees the back anyway that's going to go up against the wall I sure like the looks of this mahogany I think I'm probably going to use mahogany on the grandfather case that I'm going to build for that um, grandfather movement that I got from craft time clockery about a year ago right now that movement's still in the uh, temporary case uh, you can see that if you uh, want it's on YouTube as well This is the final coat of the varathane. I used a spray-on version of it. And I think the next time I'm going to use a wipe-on polyurethane, uh, no matter how many times I seem to sand it down and uh, respray or repaint, I always seem to have little dimples or pimples or something on the surface of the wood. Just couldn't get rid of it. Don't notice it at a distance, but up close you can see it. And I wanted it to be perfect. So I think next time I'll use a wipe-on version. Being as the back of the dial was fairly shiny, I was afraid that the 5 minute epoxy that I was going to use wouldn't stick to it, so I was just roughing it up a bit here. These little blocks that I'm gluing on are just to help hold the ring to the dial a little bit more securely than if I just glued the dial directly to the ring. Remember when I had the ring mounted in the lathe and I was making that recess so that the dial could fit in it? Well, what I should have done was made that recess a lot deeper, over a quarter of an inch deeper, so that I could have used a quarter inch dial board out of plywood, and I wouldn't have had to have bothered with these little blocks. The whole thing would have been a lot stronger, a lot easier to mount, but, you know, hindsight is better than foresight. I like the way some of these dials come with a protective plastic coating, and all you have to do is just peel this off after you're all finished, and it looks great. This is another one of those little movements that I got from Craft Time Clockery in Ontario. 
They're very inexpensive and they seem to run forever on a battery. These little battery movements are sure easy to install. A huge difference from those old-fashioned mechanical ones. Okay, so now that the clock's all made, I gotta figure out how am I gonna get this thing to Kelowna in my bag without breaking it. So, I'm making a little box here. And the next few clips are just gonna show me making the box. This drill press that I got from Canadian Woodworker is just perfect for somebody who's into woodworking. One of the nice features of this drill press is that the spindle can be moved away from the column. This of course allows you to make a hole in the middle of a large workpiece. Now I know I could have bought the one from Rikon which is a little cheaper and looks pretty much like this and is about the same size as this but in my opinion it's not as heavy duty. And according to the specs that Rikon put out, it doesn't have the ability to slow down as much as this one can. As you can see here, I'm going to slow it right down into its lowest gear, if you want to call it a gear. And it's going to be turning only about 300 RPM, which is just right for when you're trying to make a big hole with a hole saw. Now I know when you're watching the next few clips here of me making this box for the clock, you're going to say, well, he didn't have to go to all that work to make a little box for the clock. And you're right, but when you're retired, you do stuff like that. Okay, now the box is all trimmed, the clock is inside it, I'm just taping it up, and I don't see any reason why that won't survive the trip to Kelowna. Now while Mom's watching TV and she wants to know the time, all she has to do is just raise her eyes, like the Queen.